So the job here is to figure out a collective intelligence. So what? What do we do about some of that stuff? What do, can we learn from each other? And we can't do that without talking to each other, so we're going to have some of that today. We're trying to find that bright bulb of ideas. Is there anybody in the room who has only tried things that worked? Yeah, if, if, you're going to have to be pretty young in the room to have only tried things that worked. Is there anybody in the room who's never been successful? <laughs> Good. We weren't, we weren't trying to get you here, honestly. It was okay. We're trying to find those bright bulbs that we can all learn from, maybe even make them a little bit brighter. Maybe you're successful and we can make them a little bit more successful for you. So what we want to start with today is three 30-minute interviews. Uh, we're going to start with Bill Bishop, and Bill, come on up whenever you're ready. And I'm going to ask some questions and work our way through. We'll try to save a little time toward the end to let y'all ask a couple questions. But what we want to paint with Bill and Alan and Andy today is sort of the breadth. And all three have very, they're all you know, amazingly read and respected within their fields. I'm not going to read bios today. They're all in your packages. Uh, but what we want to do is make sure that we get a lot of thought out on the table to, to generate uh, where we're headed today. So let's see. I'm going to, as you're sitting down, part of the job of being the MC, you get to watch your clock and you get to bring water if you need it. Hi. Hey. How you doing? I think I'm doing okay. You want to sign my book for me? You don't. How want many that. people in the room <laughs> have? Uh, I, I would, I'm just teasing. <laughs> How many people in the room have read The Big Sort? Ooh, we got some new sales coming today. Oh yeah. So ten years ago or so, yeah. nine I guess. Yeah. Long time. Years. You wrote yeah. it 10 years ago. Is that a long time ago? Yeah. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Mike, Mike is not on. I don't feel like it's on. Let's okay. See. This I can do. Now okay. It's now I'm on. Yeah, it's, at might, least it's green. Yeah, she might want to pull that up just a little. Okay. Sorry. That's okay. At least I don't have a PowerPoint, right? That's okay. I had a short one. Okay, today. you got that one. It all works out okay. <laughs> I, I told the guests that uh, over the last year, uh, Linda and I have been part of a program that has been going around the country for the Kettering Foundation, talking to communities about community vitality and what that meant. What do communities think it meant to be, to have vitality in their community? And from the report, we, we learned a few things. And the first thing we learned is that people are scared. There's a lot of economic uneasiness when you get out in the community level and start talking to people. They're worried about the future. They don't know what to expect. Uh, urban rural was a real issue. They, people saw it. If they were in urban areas, they saw it. If they were rural areas, there was an inequity issue that had risen among the thinking. And people wanted to know more. They wanted real information. And I don't want to talk about fake this or fake that, but uh, they wanted to trust leaders, and they wanted information from them. There was a young, old divide that, that came out, but in the end, what people wanted was more conversations with each other about what was going on in their communities and what was happening in their country. And this was all in America, but uh, we also found people were hope hopeful. But we also found that the, something that was, I thought about you long before this conference, that uh, people seemed like they were in groups that were separated. And so you've talked a lot over the years and written uh, influentially about how people are grouping. Can you tell everybody what, you, what that means? Well, we started off this research that led to the book um, I came from Kentucky to Austin. I don't live in Austin anymore. I live in LaGrange, town of 4,800 in uh, the prairie of central Texas. So um, one place rich, one place poor. We tried to find out what the differences were, worked with a stats guy, and we, what we could see was that from you know the end of the uh, World War II until the mid-1970s, places were getting more alike. And then from then on, they were getting more different in every way you could imagine. Patent production was 
consolidating in some places other than other, rather than others. People with education. Okay, sorry. I'll get it right up here. Turn it the, Turn it the, the other way. So it, yeah, so it comes across. I don't know. So, so the uh, regional accents were increasing rather than decreasing. So every place was getting more different uh, over time, and politically they were getting more different too. So culturally, places were getting different. Places with technology had one kind of culture, and places without technology had another kind of culture. So uh, people, as and what I've come to think is that as old ways that we uh, built our society through communities and churches and occupations and traditions, as those broke down and lost their meaning, then we began looking for other ways to create society and we, and we began looking around for people who were like us in order to, to find some kind of community to replace the one that was lost. And do you think the trend's continuing? Oh yeah. It's probably accelerating just as, as traditions uh, continue to lose their meaning and, and hold on people. And you, when you did your report, you said from neighborhood to neighborhood, even within a city that, that might be there, oh, you yeah. can drive and know the political beings or the wealth or the whatever uh, just as you drove through a place. Yeah, I mean, that, yeah, so, yeah, in a, in a way, it's funny, uh, as old ways of sacredness lose their meaning, churches, religions, new kind of sacredness appears in everyday society. And I think Durkheim discovered that first. So, you know, wine bars and different kinds of wine and food takes on this spiritual meaning and, and the place you live, you know, takes on, I know in Austin it did, you know, the first question you're asking, where, where do you live? And that tells everything about you, you know, your entire life. And, and interestingly, Austin becomes one of the more segregated cities in the, in the country. It's weird, right? And that what I'm supposed to have is a T-shirt that You're, says, "Yeah, or or you can, uh, yes, keep or uh, keep." Another one was a nearby town was Georgetown. It was keep Georgetown normal. Was <laughs> yes, I think the Raleigh, where I spent most of that period of time, was uh, was dubbed the Nerdistan. That's what we were. Yeah, Austin was weird, and we were nerds. They're all the uh, same. They, they're, they're all they the are, same. They are all the same. What are you working on today? What's interesting? What's interesting to me is that Raj, we all think that we look for solutions in individuals. Uh, Ulrich Beck, a German sociologist, said that these days there's no public uh, a problem that doesn't demand an individual solution. We don't, and we don't think about communities providing solutions. We think about how can we change each individual. And left and right are, agree on this. You know, the left wants total. Uh, uh, social freedom for, for individuals and the right wants total economic freedom for individuals and, and so policies are shaped in that way. But there are what people call community effects that are quite powerful. And Raj Chetty and Nathaniel Hendren at Harvard, or Chetty's at Stanford, have, gone, have done this incredible study of income tax records. They, get everybody, they got everybody's income tax record. You can see from that how much people make, what sort of families they lived, on, lived in, where they lived uh, for each year over decades. And what they were able to construct was this matrix of data that shows for each county in the United States uh, what the community effects were for poor kids. Uh, in other words, for each year spent in a county, what effect did that have on the income of a, a child who grew up in a poor family at age 26? And, um, and the, they also did it with marriage. Did growing up in my county, Fayette County, Texas, did spending time as a child in Fayette County, Texas increase or decrease the chances that you will be married at age 26? And the data comes out, and it turns out essentially that the counties that were up there, the, where everybody lives, uh, where the jobs are being created, where the culture of innovation is strong, is crappy for poor kids. I mean, terrible for poor kids. Uh, the best place to grow up, the culture of, of the, uh, 
for, that best benefits poor children comes in largely rural counties. Um, in the central city counties of the cities of a million or more, only 25% of those central city counties, Travis and Austin, Dallas, you know, Fulton, you know, the, all those counties, only 25% of those have positive effects on poor children, their incomes when they, when they uh, become adults. Uh, micropolitan counties, two thirds. Rural counties, 75% of those counties have positive impacts. Uh, the culture of the, just being in that place uh, produce good impacts for, for poor kids. And I'll tell you what they think that the effects are, but what it showed me is that, oh, there's a culture of innovation and then there's a culture that's good for people, and they're not the same. Uh, the, the, the culture of innovation is, and we could see that actually in, in data that Putnam did. Yep. When you look at the, at, at the counties, at the places that are doing, producing the most patents and the most technology, people, they vote less, they trust their neighbors less, they, they are less likely to, meet, to be engaged in community activities, and, and um, uh, so hillbilly elegy, you know, oh yeah, you want to know what happened in rural, read hillbilly elegy. 75% of the Appalachian counties in Kentucky and West Virginia have positive impacts on poor kids. They make more money as adults simply because they grew up in those Appalachian counties. That doesn't mean they make their money there. They, like everything else with rural, their people are mined out. They go to the cities. They take their, the culture that they are in, in you know, that they grew up with, take them to the cities and it, it helps them become successful. And um, in fact, the New Yorker had a, a good article, we have Iowans here, uh, article on Orange City, Iowa, right? Sioux, uh, Sioux County. Sioux County is the fifth best county in the United States at moving poor kids out of poverty. Strong church, well, you know better, you know, Dutch Reformed Church. Uh, people said, oh yeah, we, you know, the self is not impor as important in, in uh, Orange City as the community. Everybody graduates from high school, less segregated economically and racially, uh, and strong, strong social capital. Lots of, you know, people belong to things. They're involved in, in fact, it was in our, our uh, guide today from the City of, Dan, uh, City of Danville for a tour, she moved back to, to, um, um, from San Francisco to Danville. And I, I asked her, well, why did you move? And she said, well, I couldn't get attached. You know, I couldn't get involved in the community in, in San Francisco, but I came back to Danville and man, I was into everything. You know, people were coming up to me, getting me, and it was, that was, it doesn't appear on the list often, but that sort of culture is what is, the bad part is, it's bad for a tech economy. So the trends, what you just laid out were tr some trends working for, some trends continuing to work against smaller urbanized places, not rural, we're, we're a little more urban here, but if you're, if you're looking for something that a lot of people say they're looking for, you're painting a picture that it's easier to find yes. in a smaller place. Yeah, if, if, you, if you're looking, and so I don't know how, if you can, and in fact that's what Chetty and Hendren are saying is that, you know, a better anti-poverty program is moving people to where, as for kids, where they can grow up in a community where they're. To, to build on that, I, I saw a quote that you said that the, this is, you know, one of the big democratic questions is how do you run a democracy in a world where everybody gets to decide their own truth and no one trusts any institutions? It's because, and it's easy to hide in a big place. You can go off and not know anybody or anything. Right. Does, does that strengthen smaller places? Well, in, in, a, uh, in places, that's not a, see, that's not a problem where I live now. Uh, because, but I also don't live now in a place that's creating new technology and you know Twitters and and Snapchats and so, um, uh, and because the self becomes less important, okay. and 
and the community becomes more important. But in, a, in a, an economy that thrives on the creation of new ideas and bringing those new ideas quickly to market, then the self is more important. How and so I would expand on that and, yeah. and, and, and say, yeah, I mean, yeah. But so the economy is demanding a, a, uh, a kind of culture that is not great for people. Are you hopeful that we're gonna, I mean, <laughs> I'm hopeful that there are still places to live that, uh, and also, you know, and I'm hopeful that people are, are finally realizing that there's this group in uh, Brooklyn called K-Hole, which I understand is a, uh, they're a marketing group, it's a drug term, my nep nieces and nephews tell me. I can explain it to you later and, uh, uh, off camera. Yes. <laughs> so, but they said, yeah, it used to be people were born in a community and then had to find their individualism. Now people are born as individuals and have to find their communities. And I think an unrealized uh, asset that small communities have is community itself and, and that they have something that people know they need and do not find in those central city counties. Makes sense. So the popular notion today is individualism. Yeah, the, Do, self, the self is the right. final arbiter of, of truth. Okay, that, that, that was deep. Uh, okay. Yeah, and, yeah. So yeah, I get to decide, I get to decide everything. I get to decide, you know, uh, uh, who's my God and, and what I am and who my, what I'm called and, you know, so yeah, and so community and the, and the community effects, which have these powerful impacts on your health and on whether you're, you vote and how much money you make and whether you get married, those are, those are dissipating as, as a part of our culture. We're going to talk to Andy a little later about community branding, but we're also, you're also painting a picture of self-branding, that we're all individually we're all, oh, yeah. self-branding ourselves. Sure, sure. How, well, the community branding is just the is is just the the aggregate is well, yeah. I mean, we're all told that we need to have our own brand and our own. What's your brand? <laughs> my, my brand is I I moved from the uh, I moved to the third largest cattle producing county in Texas from the first largest bullcrap producing county in Texas. So. <laughs> <laughs> How's the balance been for you? Pretty good so far. <laughs> it's been great. Last night, uh, uh, we still have a lot of people in, in uh, flooded. Uh, we, we were flooded in the hurricane, and we have uh, the churches uh, divide up the, the nights, and three nights a week we feed people in the, uh, who are still living in hotels, and, and it's been going on for two months, and last night I think we fed 150 people who are still living in hotels in a town of 4,800. I, uh, I say often that we're now in a, in a world where we, based on some of your research and others, that we could surround ourselves with avatars that look just like us. We build our own avatar community. But in each of the community's cases in the room, uh, for most of them, attracting people or retaining people is a real challenge. Uh, and for a lot of smaller areas around uh, the country, yeah. it's how do you attract, how do you keep some of the young people how do you bring them back? How do you attract them? How do you not get older and older? Uh, how do you, how, well, of course, one way that? is the way that it happened to our, uh, you know, our guide is that, you know, she was brought in as soon as she was showed up in town, and the community pulled her in, and embraced her, because yeah, I get the feeling people want that. I mean, it's it's fun, and people will will trade, uh, you know, the latest whatever. Uh, in your uh, hip neighborhood for that sense of being a part of something. But the community has to work on, you know, Chetty would say you work on your community institutions and your cultural, your civic capital. You work on Social not capital. being, you know, in, in being inclusive and not being uh, segregated. And you work on your schools. And I mean, Su uh, Orange City had 90, everybody graduated from high school. Everybody did. What's and that, Tupelo is like that. What does that, that mean for elected officials? What, what, would, what would you advise them to give? Boy, them? yeah, I've just started. Th I've, I've wondered whether what would be those steps. How do you how do you uh, uh, 
uh, from the outside increase your stocks of social capital? Yeah. How do you do that? You know, how do you institute a, a sense that when someone comes into town, they're welcomed and and uh, and brought into the into the community rather than ignored and you know. We, in our work, we talk a lot of communities want to start young professional groups and how do you keep young people? And we always talk about rooting that you have to find strategies to give people roots in the community and give them purpose, make them feel like they're part of that. It seems like that would be much easier in a smaller community, but because we, because the base is already there. But sometimes what you hear in small communities is, well, you know, they're not from here, or they, you know, it's this kind of thing. And you hear that, but I've lived in several small communities. I don't know. I don't find that. You seem like a nice guy, though. So you're probably out there they're, talking to them. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about leadership. I, I mean, in, in communities that are of a certain size, if communities in the room go up to three hundred thousand, so it's not. And there's some good sized communities here. There, I grew up in Dallas, North Carolina, which is population about 3,000, so a lot smaller. But in, in the communities these size, what if you were saying, I want to strengthen the leadership in the, in the community to make us, and I'll use economically vital, which means a broad thing, what advice would you give? Uh, I mean, that's why you get the chair. So I don't advice. know. You know, I don't know. How do you, how do you make sure that? That everyone feels welcome to to be involved. I don't know how. I don't honestly. I don't know how you do that. I don't have the slightest idea. Transparency, probably. You 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 have government yeah. that people can see yeah. and touch and feel like they can influence somewhere along the way. Now, the social capital things. I mean, there are there are ways you build social capital along the ways, but you know, if you're going to root young people, you're going to have to start doing that early, I guess. Yes, and, and so, yeah, and I guess all towns that, that are, are good at that do that. And, you know, we have all sorts of little clubs for teenagers, and, mm -hmm. and they go away, and, and uh, but... Do they come back ever? Uh, they, sometimes they come back. Right. Sometimes so, they come back. So if you're driving through a micropolitan community or a small metro, and you just, you've not been there, but you go driving through, how do you, what, what registers for you on whether that place is successful or not? What do you see? You know, I, I guess I, the, uh, a friend said that they, when they go into companies, they, he always looks at bulletin boards and, uh -huh. and waits to see, you know, sees what's on. So I always look at bulletin boards in places and what's on the, the uh, what's pasted on the windows of the shops downtown. And, and uh, I went through some place in, in uh, southern Vermont, as a matter of fact, and if the guys at the gas station are wearing those you know, black bracelets with the little monitors on them. You know, that's probably that's not, not a good, a, that's not a good sign. Okay, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, it's pretty, well, pretty obvious. Uh, I do that too. I stop at diners, and I have a. Yeah. I get kidded all the time because I go by and I ask people, you know, "What's it like here?" And the waitress always goes, "Well, she never doesn't answer. I mean, she usually a long diatribe, but mostly good. Most people don't complain in the small community. They don't start out on." what's wrong, they start out about what's right. And that might be simple, it might be, oh, we just opened a new whatever, or oh, people here are friendly and all, but if I'm driving down the streets, I mean, very few small towns don't have boarded up buildings because the world's changed and something closed. But can you tell if, they're, if they care about their communities? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that you, I mean, yeah, but we, that's what my wife and I, that's what we do on vacations is drive around and and in, in fact, we drove uh, through a bunch of pot growing community, uh, communities in Northern California. Okay. And, uh, and if, you know, if, you, if you, people are thinking about medical marijuana and growing pot, go to Northern California. It's not, it's not a great thing to, I mean, tons of homeless kids running around. And, but we went into a church, United Church of Christ, good liberal church. They're all sitting around, it was Peace Week. And they were, uh, so we had a Native American guy and he was playing a pipe and you know, drumming and all that stuff. And, and afterwards, the good people of the church passed out little pieces of paper to one another. And they said, it's a, they said, right on here, what it would take for you to work with other people in your community? And Julie and I looked at each other and said, what the hell? You know, they have problems with that in there. And, 
they have lost that. And so I go back to the Chetty data, and mm -hmm. in fact, it's a rural community, but they, they ranked negatively. They're, they had so little social capital in that community, they didn't know how to work with each other. Even people in the same church, all the same demographic, they didn't know how to work with each other. And so they ranked low on the, they, they were, it was a bad place for poor people to grow up, partially because, I think, because they didn't have those social connections. And, uh, and so is there a way to look at a place and see whether those, that community still exists? I want to open it up and see if you have questions. For Bill, uh, I'm not going to pass the mic around. If you say the question, I'll repeat it for the for the video. But any questions for Bill? And don't be shy. This is supposed to be a conversation. Maybe just an observation that uh, in my market of an applicant crowd, but, uh, you would hire a, a kid, okay, anybody from uh, a community north of Highway 29, regardless of what the residents are. Because they were going to come to work, they were going to work hard, they were creative, they're all farm kids for well, no. And the reverse logic for trying to integrate that uh, upbringing and comfort and culture and engagement, I'd really like to know how anybody does that. So if, if it were as simple as just Next point. So we're as simple as well. We're going to send our poverty program to the country. It wouldn't work. No. So, uh, and, and if, if that were the case, you would have to have an economy to support the magic that happens on a really small scale. So, right. I don't. It's more comment than question. But it's just, has anybody done anything that? remotely approaches trying to take that data and sprinkle that in an urban area or a well, there were, yeah, let me repeat, the, the point was that there are kids that will get a job because they come from an area that have, that you already know they're going to be hardworking, they might, you know, they've got the background, but if they don't have the background, how do you make that transition? What do you do to try to be more inclusive about the, about the future workforce. Yeah, I don't know how. Um, I don't know how you create something that is how you create that community, you know that that exists. And incidentally, those are the counties that I mean you picked it out exactly. The great if you want to. Uh, there, well, there was a there was an experiment. There have been various experiments. Moving to opportunity was one, and the initial uh, studies of that, and that's where they they gave people vouchers to move to other places to get out of poor city, poor parts of cities, the richer part. Of, and uh, the initial work was well, it didn't have much effect because it didn't change the outcomes for the adults. But when Chetty and those people went back and looked at what happened to those kids, who were uh, moved, uh, th the effects were, were great. Uh, but they moved within a metro area. So instead of being in Travis County in Texas, they might move, move to Bastrop or to, uh, I've never seen it, you know, there, I don't think there have been any experience where they moved from, you know, Cook County to the, someplace in the Great Plains. Other questions? I'm curious, about, I'm curious about, you talked about self-driven and the self and being motivated by what you want, what you need, and community-driven as being kind of on two opposite ends. When a significant say, portion of your population are now millennials, where that is paramount and key and kind of exactly how they work and operate is in their in their own Yeah, it's exactly opposite, right? Yeah, I mean, that, there is no reconciliation. And so, I mean, that's why adult 
millennials are more likely to move, you know, to those inner city areas. Was that wrong? Was that, did, did that make sense? Or, I mean, they're more, more likely to move to those inner city areas because that is the community that, that my, my question is, will that kind of life eventually, people will see, well, I'm missing something. There have been but some people who've written a lot about whether community in the future is geography. And what the nature of millennials and their community is electronic community, that it isn't place-based. And what the challenges are for places where their tightest community networks aren't in there. And I, you know, we have millennials in our company and I have two kids in their late 20s and their worlds aren't their neighborhoods. And it, it's a challenge to, to root them locally. And I, I think that, that that electronic lack of roots is, some, is a challenge that we, we all face. So it makes me wonder if we as communities we think a little bit differently about what Well, they get more segregated because. Well, because they do need to be in community, and and so the communities become self-created. They become uh, communities of choice rather than communities of, of dissent. Uh, so I'm not I'm not uh, I, I'm not a working class kid. So I don't live in a work. I'm not a Catholic because my parents were Catholics. They, the, you know. Uh, and so the communities become become becomes become ones of choice rather than ones of of dissent. And so the communities will create, and that's why we have the the segregation and the sorting that we do, is that the communities are being recreated around uh, the choices of people trying to to get back what they what was lost. And I think a lot of it was lost. You know, it's great. You know, that a lot of we needed to lose a lot of that. But we're now we're left with the individual having to is on his or her own to 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 make his or her own own community. So you're not a believer that we're going to have a community of people that are supposed to be. No, that I mean that's and, and in fact I mean you look at the economy. We can look at the economy for that. 
place is now more important than ever. Uh, being around others who, who have the ideas and the skills and you know it's more important who you work around than, rather than less. So jobs, certain kinds of jobs are, are uh, you know, accumulating and agglomerating at, at a faster rate, right? They are, although I, I think I'm somewhere in between with this. <laughs> uh, I think you're going to have both. I think the communities of digital communities are going to be an important part going forward. Uh, and I think a lot of that's good. You've got global communities now with you know, whatever label you want to give people under our age. Pick it any label you want. But th those uh, communities are strengthening. It, it makes people more aware. At the same time, I, I agree completely with Bill that people have choices more so than ever. And those choices tend to be that, you know, I, I've seen the... I forgot who did the report, it's been 10 years ago. I don't think it was you who was doing game theory on choices. And that if, if you decided to move into a neighborhood and you just didn't want to be the only person in the neighborhood that was poor, white, whatever, the, that over some long period of time, just by choosing that, the neighborhoods got more and more segregated into spaces. And then you overlay that with what we do with real estate development now and zoning and other things and we, We've created pockets, uh, even in mixed-use communities. You, you know, there are well, pockets of wealth and pockets of privilege. And so, and and those are related to politics. So we we toured downtown Danville, walkable community, walkable, well, i.e. democratic. I mean, when when Pew asked people where where they wanted to live, Democrats wanted to live in walkable community, smaller places, but I could walk to a restaurant. Republicans wanted bigger yards, bigger. And so that's, in a way, that's, you know, it's, anyway, it's what it is. It's, it's lifestyle now connotes uh, politics. Jump in. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Uh, I need a laser report. Uh, my, I'm Jasmine Alpine, <laughs> and I actually work for the city of Toronto, but I work with the economic development. So um, kind of going back to your this culture of innovation and what culture of change and culture of people concept, and there was a study that they just did actually after the election. Um, it's the, the folks who wrote Halloween on the middle, I'm trying to find the name yeah. I read the article, and basically what they were saying is they came back to Iowa and went to these small towns um, that have historically been like a pipeline for places like Des Moines, like Cedar Rapids, and you'll see we have population increase in just a few places in the state who relied on that pipeline from small communities. But what they found in this study was that these students that were seen as like high, uh, high achievement potential early on are sort of groomed to leave the communities because there are so I guess that I can completely see that concept of like, yes, you are more likely to be involved and you have more people around you. It like takes a village concept, so you may become more well-rounded, but then the threat is then to leave. So then I, I guess like the chicken and the egg thing starts to get confusing there about, so how do you get them back because there's no jobs, there's no opportunity. So at some point, does it become, like, do you put your resources where you may be able to keep people, or do you try really hard to, to maintain all of these rural communities. And so, it, and it may be a, a huge issue for Iowa because we have 99 counties still in Iowa right. and these small towns seem to be pretty important to our state legislature, but at the risk of potentially the, the only places where we're at, able to capture some of that. So, I guess just kind of interested in your thoughts on I, you know, that's another one. I just don't, you know, how do you make that decision about, I mean, places will make it or not, right? And, and, uh, and people will go, they'll grow up and they will go away. And, uh, and that's probably why the, uh, poor kids do better, is that they're told from a, a very early age, yeah, you're going to have to get out of here. You're going to have to make your way. It's up to, you know, you have to find your way to, so, so uh, but and there are all sorts of strategies to get people back. I know Ord, uh, Nebraska has a fund that pays, you know, well, people from Ord who want to come back, yeah, we can help fund your business. And, and so the, the strategies, uh, I was just out in San Angelo, Texas, 100,000 people. That's how they get their doctors. Uh, ranching families whose kids go to medical school, they want to come back, uh, we'll, get, you know, we'll get them back, they're, they're attached to the land and we'll get them a job at Shannon Hospital. And, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, there's strategies for doing that. And it's, it's a good one. Let's do one more question. Someone over here, uh, ma'am. Um, thank you. And as a journalist, the main driving thing is like, you Oh, 
well, I don't really do that much any. The, yeah, the question was, as a journalist, has the, the changes changed uh, Bill's perspective and how he views success? Yeah, success is no, is no longer working at a newspaper. I mean, they're, 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 they, uh, you know, they're losing, they're, they don't, since, A, people no longer look to authorities uh, uh, for their, and B, they get to choose what is, you know, they're the sort of arbiters of, of truth, uh, then the newspapers lose their grip and there are all sorts of advertising. And, and so they, uh, news organizations um, uh, target just like other places and they target politically and it's just boring. It's just the journalism becomes boring because, I mean, we have the Texas Observer uh, in Texas that the Journal of Free Voices, we, and it's like, it's a Democratic Party uh, sheet now. You know, that's not a journal. It's so, you, but you have to, you have to pick a side, go with it, and that brings your audience. So it's just kind of sad. To repeat that, a, a significant role that people, the journalists should be playing to, I, I, uh, to break down those barriers or break down those. I, yeah, I don't. This is bigger than anything a newspaper uh, than journalism. Journalism is the. It's just the tail, the tail on the dog. I hate leave stop it on that one. But I really do. One more question. Darn y'all, you gotta make me do this. Well, let's thank them. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Alan, would you join us up here and we'll see if we can re-mic here.